Good afternoon, or good morning, I don't even know what time it is. My name is Maria. Uh, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel. Uh, hopefully they'll do most of the talking, and if I do talk too much, you can put your hand up. Um, I'm going to start with Huweda Saad, and for those of you who were here yesterday, she needs no introductions. She works for the New York Times. She has written extensively about Beirut and Syria, um, writing about ISIS, the humanitarian crisis, and beyond. Welcome, Huweda, again. Thank you. Thank you uh, next to Huweda is Indre Makaratite, pronounced it right from Lithuania, from the uh, Lithuanian Public Television. She's an investigative journalist. Uh, she has been a political journalist, a host of Hard Talks, and one of the best-known journalists from Lithuania. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Arshak Tovmasyan. He is the founder of Regional Post Caucasus Media, an English language platform covering political, social, economic, and cultural news in Armenia. And you will be launching the Russian version yes. of Regional uh, Post in June, so you can look forward to that. Right. Next is Anike Hudala from NOST. NOST <laughs> is a network of European journalists. She specializes in uh, the political transformation of post-communist countries. She was a journalist for Czech Weekly Respect, and we work together with Anike. Welcome. Hi. Hello. Next is Nerses Kopalian. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His fields of specialization include international security, geopolitics, political theory, and philosophy of science. Uh, if I got that right, he's the author of several books. He's a regular contributor on EVN Report. Welcome, Nerses. Thank you. Um, this is going to be an interesting conversation because we are living um, at a time of deep divisions, not only in Armenia, but I would argue globally. Narratives are being constructed, then they're being deconstructed, oftentimes for narrow political gains. And why did we choose to talk about this? Because political narratives are very similar, again, I would argue, to fictional narratives. They can be dramatic plots filled with narratives about the good guys versus the bad guys. And citizens and readers, people, populations oftentimes get caught up in those narratives um, and they see themselves as characters in those dramas without really having substantive discussions about you know, political issues or policies. Um, this then is intensified through the echo chambers of social media uh, where filter bubbles are created and people uh, feel safe in the ideological constructs of those filter bubbles. What is the role of the media in shaping narratives? Uh, I do want to talk about the Armenian reality, but also first start with the global reality and in your own countries. How are these, what is the role of the media and why is it even important to help citizens, people understand the political processes that are taking place. And one more thing I will say, I will argue that we can fact check from here to kingdom, kingdom come, but it's all about a value system and beliefs. How politicians shape stories and how do we feel comfortable in that and how, what is the role of the media in countering that or sometimes do we inflate it and make it worse than it actually is. Um, Hoida, you come from a very complex part of the world. Um, you know, in Armenia, we always talk about no war, no peace. I would argue the Middle East is the same situation, and there are many different narratives being created. So how, have, as a reporter, have you been able to work in that reality? Well, Maria, this is very true. The, 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 today, the world is more divided than ever. Just we are so much, we're facing the division, division in, in Lebanon, division in Syria, division among the parties. Sometimes I get like, who's the enemy? Who's the ally? What's the truth? What's the, what's the true story? What's behind the this, uh, this story? Who's right? Who's wrong? You know, like, and, and, uh, and as I said, I'm coming from Lebanon, which is like really, it's, it's the most divided place where like there are parties, you meet them, and every each party, they, they try to, to, to prove to you that he's the right one. He's, you know, the others are the enemies. And when you go to the other party, they say that the others are the enemy. For instance, when the, you know, I always refer to the, to the Beirut blast, like the, the, you know, in, in August 4, 2020, 
you know, every party was trying to accuse the other party that he's behind that, this thing. And me as, you know, like us as a journalist, we try to find out, like, of course, we cannot find the absolute truth. We try to, we seek it. We, we try to look after the truth. We try to, uh, to, to find, you know, the, 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 the story, what happened. And um, that was very, 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 very hard because uh, when you go to the, uh, you know, for instance, you go to, the, the, to, to, to one of the parties, you ask them, like, why the nitrate was, there, was in the port. He will tell you, it's not us. Okay, but you were there. You were running the, the Beirut port. What happened to us? Well, you ask the other people, the other, the other party. You go to the other, to, to the other party. You ask them, okay, the other party is accusing you. He said, no, 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 we, we, it's not us. So sometimes you find yourself stuck and how to, to, to start the story, how to begin. For us, sometimes... You, sh you, you, you know, you only, you, the only way you have to do it is to write about it. Okay, sometimes you cannot tell the readers what's, what's, what's the true story, what's, what's, uh, what's right. It's very hard. Sometimes you find yourself, you're really stuck in that. Because if you ju jump into, into judgments or you jump into conclusions, maybe it's not the true. So you find yourself really stuck sometimes in some in very complicated stories. Thank you. Indra, as a, a journalist who has, you know, covered politics in your country now as an investigative journalist, do you feel, and again, I, I'm not too familiar with the situation in Lithuania, but do you feel that these uh, narratives being created by government, politicians, um, are, are, is the media able to counter those? I will tell you a little bit different story because uh, uh, hard times really make societies very, very polarized. But what we have in Lithuania, in, in the Baltic states, and I can imagine that this exists uh, in Armenia as well, what we have uh, uh, Russian propaganda and uh, disinformation very strong and they create their own narrative and um, uh, they They've always been in Lithuania and in the Baltics, but um, uh, during pandemic, they got um, uh, they got uh, uh, new strength. Mm. They got um, a very good background and very good um, soil for their work because people were angry, they were tired, they were. Uh, uh, they didn't want to live under the, you know, restrictions. And uh, these groups, they started to create a new narrative and they were against everything. Uh, we didn't have the uh, vaccines and the vaccines were not created yet. They uh, were fighting against uh, restrictions. Then the vaccines appeared. They started uh, protesting against uh, vaccination. If they do not have uh, pandemic as a topic, they choose something from, uh, from the history, from the occupation period, from the Holocaust, from the Soviet occupation. Uh, they touch on uh, upon the patriotic uh, line and they find something very sensitive to the society. And they not only find these topics, but they escalate that. And uh, uh, what we did, we've uh, been working with these narratives uh, for, more, for, more, for more than one year as an investigative group. And uh, we detected that uh, uh, among those people who created these narratives and even uh, politi political movements, there are people uh, directly connected to pro-Kremlin organizations. So, uh, and what is the role of media? Okay, we, we can detect that, uh, them, yes. They, they are very uh, uh, deep in the social um, uh, network, but um, they refused uh, to talk to journalists. Uh, their aim is to um, discredit it, discredit uh, the mainstream media. They don't let journalists come into their uh, meetings. They don't let uh, journalists uh, to cover the protests. They beat them. They uh, shout at them. And uh, they don't want uh, journalists to cover what they are doing. 
So they create kind of an alternative uh, world where they take in the people and they don't let uh, independent observers to participate. So that's what we uh, like have now in Lithuania and in the Baltics. Mm -hmm. And it goes like, you know, a red line uh, from Poland to Lithuania to Latvia and Estonia. It's, and, and then it continues here. And continues <laughs> here, yes. So this is, uh, this is very important to, uh, to, 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 to mainstream media to understand that, uh, that you know, um, uh, wave of uh, uh, wave of um, information against uh, mainstream media against journalists uh, is like coming from Russia and from coming from Russian uh, propagandists. So this is this is our a new reality right now. Right. Well, I, I think we all understand that propaganda and fake news uh, is not produced at random, but it's tailored for a particular political uh, demographic. Anike, as somebody who has studied the post-communist, post-Soviet space, some of what uh, Indira is saying is very common here. Um, they take certain national values or certain, um, they weaponize certain groups uh, for their advantage and then there's always attacks on independent media. You're always uh, attacked for one thing or another. Um, and it's almost like the same script being written over and over again. Um, would you say that this is a, a result of not having the culture during the Soviet era of independent, credible, quality, professional media and this lack of trust? Do you see that across the board? Well, I think one uh, very common feature of all post-communist societies is that there is a, um, a thinking of friend and foe is very widespread. And so whole societies are divided into these camps, so to say, and accusing each other of uh, lying or of not telling the truth and of uh, following uh, yeah, some interests and so on. So this seems to be the basic problem of all, uh, all the discussions and all these problems of disinformation and and this political struggle, because if there's no consensus within the society and within the political elite on what actually, what kind of a state we want to be and where do we want to go, what is our future, then you will never go anywhere. And then you get very vulnerable for this kind of disinformation campaigns. So, because your first question was, what can media contribute to counter these, uh, these problems? I think uh, there are two answers that lie, are lying at hand, so to say, first is to really include experts into your political reporting. Not only, it's not only your, your own opinion and your own observation, but you really need to, to give evidence to your, to your reporting by including really expertise. This, at least uh, we can see in Germany, is, is functioning very well. And at the same time, um, something that was said yesterday on the political narratives, um, a panel is you really have to go and see why do people believe this disinformation? Yeah, why you, you mentioned the soil on, on which it is grounded. Yeah, you really have to see why do people why are they so vulnerable? Why do they believe Russian disinformation or any conspiracy theories? Mm -hmm. So, what is their problem actually? You know, Anike, we try to do that at EBN Report. Uh, Nerses is not a journalist, but he writes for us as and he's a political scientist. Um, even some of, and I'll come to the question for you, Nerses, but even some of the articles that he writes, if it doesn't fit into the political narrative of certain groups, it is um, discredited, it is, you know, fake journalism, yellow journalism. So even when we try to say, okay, if we're going to write about the economy, we're going to ask an economist to write about it or a political scientist to write about it to help, you know, elevate. But again, because we've made these little boxes for ourselves, even that becomes challenging. Um, and speaking of narratives, Ashok, Armenia... Um, is deeply polarized, especially uh, following the 2020 Artsakh war. And, you know, even our exhibition, so much of it is about the war, and it's a constant shadow that follows us everywhere that we go. And some of the questions that I personally asked myself after the war was, did we do our role properly as journalists? Did we believe the political narrative that developed post let's say in the mid 2000s, and did we not do our jobs properly to have raised the issues that we saw so clearly after the war? What well, do you think about the role that we played or didn't play? Uh, yes, it's 
true that uh, all Armenians are basically working with PTSD after the after the war. And it's a it's a very difficult question because we don't know if we did enough. We uh, we don't know if we were journalists first or citizens first because a lot of time we were not questioning what we were getting as an information from the state, believing in the in even knowingly understand we, we were understanding that it's propaganda, but we are we are still believing. We wanted to believe in this propaganda, and as media, I think we somehow supported this propaganda. We didn't question things enough during the war and after the war, and actually before the war also maybe, and. Uh, as a result, uh, the, the way the state managed the war went unchallenged by the media, and uh, we sh this is the lesson we have to learn from it. The, the, the other question that we have to understand that we have to do better with is the media literacy. Because and during the war and after the war, we, <clears throat> we see how the facts get lost in the middle of all the conversation, in the middle of the social media, everywhere. And yes, as you said, we can fact check as much as we want, but it's not enough. We, we have to be at the, at the beginning of a movement which will change the way our nation is interacting with the media. And uh, maybe we can start with schools, with children. Maybe we can have a class about media literacy. So, no, we didn't do enough, and now Armenian nation is in a crisis of, of a narrative. We don't have a national narrative, a universally accepted national narrative anymore. We had national narratives before the war, with three main narratives. It was the Watch Me Tiza Kanutyun, which I would translate maybe as the position of Armenia and Armenians that we are not going to accept any concessions in the question of the status of Karabakh and the territory around the, the territory of Karabakh, even the territory which was not part of the Karabakh uh, autonomy during the Soviet time. Yeah? The second narrative with, which was universally accepted uh, was that the, Tur the Turkey and our, uh, Azerbaijan are our enemies, historical enemies, and they are going to be our enemies in the future. So if they get a chance, they will finish off what they started uh, with the genocide. They will just finish us off. And the third narrative was about Russia, that Russia is our big brother, our ally, our friend, and they are going to help us when there is a war, and not, help, not only help Armenia, but also help Artsakh. That's why we should be okay with the ever-growing role of Russia in all the, all the sectors of Armenian political and economical life. Well, the war, let's say, destroyed or challenged or deconstructed all these narratives. And uh, we found ourselves in a vacuum, uh, in, a, in, a, in an ideological vacuum. So when there is a vacuum, there are always forces who are trying to fill this vacuum. So we had two narratives who, who kind of started to compete each other with each other against after the war. The first was pushed by the government just after the war, and it was the idea of the age of uh, uh, age of peace, yeah? Age of peace. of peace. So basically it means that we are okay with some uh, concessions in order to achieve this age of peace. So we have to improve our relations with Turkey, maybe even Azerbaijan, and especially with, with, with the West. Why? Because we are this island of democracy and human rights and all the good stuff in a region full of uh, tyrants and uh, dictators. And this is the idea that was pushed by, by our government after the war. But in the same time, when they were nego negotiating with Russians, I don't think they, are, they were giving this ideas to them, so, so they are even lost a little bit between these two orientations. And the second one, uh, the second narrative that we had after the war is basically Nikol Pashinyan and his team are the root of all evil, and we have to get rid of them in order to 
find our dignity, find uh, a way to live better, and maybe find a way to bring back Shushi and Hadrut, and maybe more, some claim more. And when you ask how you are going to do that, they say, just let's get rid of Nicole Pashinyan, then we will tell you. So we have these competing uh, narratives in Armenia right now. They both have minimal support or not a, ma not a majoritarian support. And we have the Armenian nation in the middle of it with people leaning to, to the one side or to the other side. And we are still in an ideological crisis. And a country like Armenia needs a national narrative to go forward. Building upon what you said, we do have these, there, there is a need for a new national narrative. Um, and there are conflicting uh, paths that we all see. Nurses, as a clinical observer of political processes and um, perhaps of the media, because you're also right for the media, what can the Armenian media do? Sorry, I'm gonna shift a little bit to the national uh, issue here. Uh, can the Armenian media, are we, creating a platform for discussion, because that's what I think the, one of the biggest roles of media is, aside from educating and inspiring and informing. It's about being a space for critical discourse. And it's interesting because this morning's panel on cultural narratives spoke about this very thing. So are we doing our jobs well enough? So generally speaking, uh, you don't have a tradition of sophisticated journalism in, in Armenia. And so this is why I said it's a work in progress. Uh, because aside from uh, setting the discourse or become a platform of dialogue, more important than that, the media's primary uh, responsibility in any growing democracy is accountability, meaning holding the corridors of power accountable and thus uh, demanding or stipulating transparency and you know, undertaking to give an activities where which the media serves as a conduit between government and the information that the average citizen receives. To do that requires obviously a certain skill set. And this is the professionals of that we generally speak of. So when we observe the role of the media, the effect that the media has on given societies, the big discrepancy that's observable is clearly in the quality and sophistication, the legacy that the media has. So this is why it is a work uh, in progress as far as Armenia is concerned. Now when we look, observe the developments in Armenia, the very concept of being a journalist is really not clearly defined in Armenia. What constitutes a journalist? Uh, what are the responsibilities of a journalist? Is it to report? Is it to engage in discourse? Is it to engage, engage in investigative journalism to basically hold the quarters of power responsible? These, these things are still developed, being developed. They have not been sufficiently institutionalized or articulated. And this is why I noted it's a, it is a, it's a work in progress. But fundamentally, everything cannot be placed on the shoulders of the media. A big part of the environment that the media works in is the social and political culture through which it uh, functions and operates. So we spoke about the issue of polarization. You know, we saw the attempt uh, by these uh, youth to kind of, you know, immerse themselves into this discourse. Um, what shapes that, right? What defines that? The media can be an opinion leader, but it's not fair. And so a lot of the political culture, the social culture that we have in Armenia, there's a certain misunderstanding of the media's role. And because the media cannot cogently fill all those gaps in society, it is still sort of weaving this web of what its role is, what its functions are, what its responsibilities are. So, you know, and this is not specific to Armenia. This is very common to post-Soviet space as well, uh, where you basically have societies that are uh, post-authoritarian, societies that are developing, and they are attempting to find sort of this medium between media responsibility, media role, media relevance, and its relation to both government and society. But I would argue you have the same problem in the United States. Um, uh, there was a campaign uh, video, I think it was the 2016 uh, campaign, presidential campaign, where uh, the Trump uh, camp was talking about two Americas, right? The America of Hillary Clinton, which was full of crime, corruption, illegal immigration, and the, the America of Trump, which people would be safe and secure. And these, I mean, it created 
they were perhaps under the surface, but these huge divisions, huge you know, these fault lines. Um, I've always argued that the problem of fake media, sorry, started with your past president, and uh, when he coined the term, started accusing the media of being, you know, fake or sold out or, or, or whatever, and it seemed to have a ripple effect globally, and we, we're still feeling those things. And then on top of that, of course, is the algorithms of social media, and, exactly. and how do we... I mean, in our media, Facebook, when you ask someone where do you find, where did you hear that, when they tell you something, they said, I read it on Facebook. And I said, well, Facebook is not a news organization. Yeah, yeah. exactly. This is what I, I want to talk about, you know, speaking of the, like, as us as a journalist, what is our role? Is our role just to, to find solutions for conflicts? Is our role to fight, to fight sectarianism? Is our role to end up wars? No, we cannot uh, end up wars. We cannot uh, just uh, we cannot uh, create a peaceful world. It's not uh, our job. Our job is to convey to, to convey the, the you know like the news to tell the, to share the, the news with the readers. And sometimes like the readers they think this is the truth, and others they think no, it's fabricated. So our role it's not in some and I will take it from nurses. Sometimes there is a misunderstanding of our role. Just some people like they think you know our role is an NGO. I'm not NGO. Like sometimes, whenever I meet people, they ask me for help. I'm, I cannot help you. And some people, they uh, some you know, whenever I meet a politician or something, they please help me to you know, to, just to to polish my whatever image. I, I'm, it's not my role. This is not my role. I'm a journalist. Of course, sometimes it's, a, it's very risky. Like, and this is very like um, unlikely. Like to be affiliated with some parties, which is sometimes you f you find yourself you are in a position you have to work with this politician, you have to polish the, the image of this uh, party or the other party. Um, but our role, our role, and this is, you know, like, as you said, Maria, this is, uh, we are just, we find ourselves like just amid of a uh, lot, lot of false news, misleading news, uh, the social media. So where to start, how to start, you know, for us, just we go, we see what, you know, we, 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 co we cover this in news, we cover the reports, we show the readers this is what happened. Sometimes we cannot just, you know, tell the reader this is, you know, you know uh, this is what, what we find is the, it, it's the real truth or this is the, 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 the story, like this is the true story. It's up to the reader to, to weigh that, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. you, as a host of uh, previously of, of, of news shows or hard talks or as a political journalist, um, is there political dialogue in, in the sense that, um, as a journalist, how do you mediate those different political viewpoints? You know, we had that discussion in Lithuania, what to do, how, uh, how could journalists uh, uh, help the society and the political narratives uh, to, like, you know, to, to match somehow, you know, to, to, to have that fruitful discussion. And yes, we, you know, we, we think that journalists should be less arrogant, probably. They should go to the street more, yes. They have to talk to everybody in the street. We have to talk to that, uh, uh, like, you know, harsh anti-vaccine uh, anti uh, uh, person who is like, you know, crazy about this, uh, crazy theories. But, you know, um, uh, okay, so we decided that, okay, we will not be that ar arrogant journalist and we will talk and we will talk to everyone who is on that propaganda list, who organizing that propaganda in, in, in Lithuanian social media. And, you know, I personally uh, call them, uh, called them and, you know, sometimes you really you have to take it to, to keep the phone like 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 this you know because you hear that screaming shouting and you uh, from the very beginning when they hear uh, the your surname that who is calling and the 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 very moment you um, uh, you even you know you, you can even uh, switch on the uh, the internet media, like, you know, go, go to, to that internet media and you see you yourself because they put directly you uh, online uh, the, the same moment that you, then you call them. And 
it's like my kids uh, 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 often laugh at me. You know, my daughter says to, 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 to his brother, you know, uh, it's again the campaign against, hate campaign against mom started. Have, <laughs> have you seen it? Because they put my picture, you know, in different GIFs, memos, etc., and they, they circulated that in, in that uh, propaganda media. So, and we have that question in Lithuania, should we really uh, um, talk to these people and to become uh, the content of the propaganda for them? Should they be, uh, um, should we uh, think about them as the, uh, the part of the society or they are the tool of the propaganda and they, they are not about democracy. They are not about the freedom of his speech. They use freedom of his speech. They use democratic institutions and our democracy to, to fight the democracy. So, yes, and these are very painful questions, I think, and these are very difficult questions to answer, like, you know, here in the discussion, but, uh, but I think we really have to rethink uh, the whole uh, structure and the whole uh, picture of what's happening uh, here in Armenia, in Ukraine, and the Baltic states, and the changing uh, face and changing uh, uh, position of Russia, especially Russia. Mm. Okay. Asha, interested some interesting things, and our children should speak to one another because my kids are always worried about me as well. Um, we have lost the trust of the public in Armenia. Um, we, journalists. I think, I, I think that we are seen as people who... And it was really interesting yesterday on the narrative journalism panel how many of the speakers spoke about empathy and uh, remain, not losing your humanity as a journalist. And it's okay to feel, and it's okay um, when there's a war not to know how to report on the when it's your country at war and when it's your, uh, when it's your soldiers that are getting killed and uh, citizens being displaced. Um, how do we regain the trust? Okay, let me reframe the question. Do you feel that, the, uh, putting the war aside huh, in general, do you feel that the Armenian media is doing its, uh, is accomplishing its mission in Armenia? If we have lost the trust of the public, how do we regain it? <clears throat> It's a very difficult question. I keep asking uh, you difficult yes, questions. Sorry. Yes, uh, and I don't know if I have the answer, but uh, for me, mm, the way to go forward is to understand your priorities as a media and, uh, well, not, not to sell your soul in some yeah. way. Uh, so in Armenia, we have a lot of media who have uh, some questionable identity. They are... Uh, uh, they are pushing forward agendas. I think uh, the Armenian media, the independent media, have to understand that the priority of your media has to be Armenia. And we, we have to uh, unite around the idea of Armenia centuries and, uh, yeah, continue forward uh, having uh, in mind uh, what is the important thing that we are doing for the public why we are doing this and uh, what, what we want to build with the help of the media. Okay. So, Anike, do you think that propaganda, misinformation, fake news uh, proliferates more because as journalists, perhaps we have failed in our, in our jobs? If you could just sort of take a zoom, a zoom out on that. Um. Well, I can't assess whether we or, or somebody has failed or not, but uh, what I think is very important is that we are not reporting about them as they, but we have to, if, if we want to do something, a good service to our country, we have to comprise the whole society and we have to look at all segments of society and try to be empathetic about them and to understand, and to, at least not to understand, to, to accept their values, but to see what are their values and which is their perspective on the whole thing. So this is very important to be inclusive. And speaking of inclusiveness, if I may get back to the question you asked before, what can we do to gain, gain trust again? I think one key problem of, of many 
post-communist but also other countries is um, the question of a public broadcasting station. Maybe you can also tell us something about the Lithuanian case, but I think, as I was told in Armenia, there's this problem that the public broadcasting is financed through the state budget and uh, people are more or less... Uh, yeah, hired because of their political affiliation and so on. So, of course, this does not build trust in any case. So it is extremely important to have institutions, a public broadcasting station that is as far away as possible from the state and from the political sphere. And there are institutional tools to, to secure the, or to guarantee this. Uh, just a small example, financing. If you take it from the state budget, of course, this will always be subject to, to political decisions. But if it's uh, in Germany, we have a system of uh, everybody has to pay a fee each month, and this is collected by an uh, institution separate from the state. It has got nothing to do with the state, and they collect and administer this money. And so this is a very important uh, step towards more independence of this public broadcasting station. And so maybe if you have at least one public a one TV station that you can really be sure it's not politically biased or partisan, then this would be a major step, maybe. Mm -hmm. We used to have a running joke in Armenia that I want to live in the Armenia that I see on Armenian public television yeah. <laughs> because it was never really a reflection of what really what we were really living through. But Indra, do you want to pick up on yeah, that? Because um, uh, we have that separate uh, law on our broadcaster and we have separate, you know, budget. It's not uh, decided mm -hmm. every year and everything is okay with that. But despite that fact, uh, you know, there are always people. Uh, there are always people who, um, uh, who, who, t who make national broadcast uh, broadcast as a tar target, always because it's very easy, very convenient target, uh, because you know it gets money and uh, somehow they even you know manage to 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 build up a myth that a national broadcaster is our media, so they have to broadcast what we think mm -hmm. is important. Like, we are the nation, that group of people who are protesting, we are the nation, and they must, you know, uh, they must uh, uh, do reports what, the way we think uh, is the right report, you know? Not that, you know, that, that part of the society, that part of the society, but the way we want. And they go with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, they go shouting in the in uh, in the streets, you know, against national broadcaster, against journalists working in the uh, in the national broadcaster, and they, at some point, they, you know, they are creating a national broadcaster as an enemy of the nation. But this is, you know, this is again uh, one of the goals of. Uh, uh, of our enemy, let's say it's, uh, this is the, one of the goals of the propaganda, and they really they they this is number one on the list. And behind that, they have, you know, uh, the target is the whole mainstream media, but uh, the national broadcast is very good, very good, you know, uh, being in the very uh, first line, you know, in the very front. So this is, uh, and it's the same in, in the Baltics. Not yeah, only we have in that in Germany as well. Mm. There are large, uh, or there's a part of the population yeah. protesting and thinking they, uh, they provide distorted information and so on. Of mm -hmm. course, we have that, that as well. But if, if you have um, a, a broadcasting station that really pays attention to portraying different groups and portraying and, and, um, and providing different opinions on the Jeez. same topic, so actually I think then uh, it might be possible to to satisfy most of the population. Uh, um, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I wanted to, to elaborate more about that experts, like, you know, journalists should uh, not, uh, you know, uh, talk from themselves, but to ask experts and, but they create proxy expert groups mm. and proxy expert institutes. And they, you know, and uh, these scientists, scientists in these proxy, uh, like, you know, uh, expert groups are not real scientists. So, and it's, this is like, you know, they are really, they are creating that alternative world. And it's so difficult, you know, it, to, 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 to people to understand that. We understand that. And, you know, then you go to, to, to they, then you are forced to go to that uh, expert institute. You feel ashamed, you know, how can you go there? Because you don't, you, 
you you don't think that that person is an, a real expert mm -hmm. you know he's like a, uh he okay he wants to talk about vaccines but he's not uh, like you know he has anything with vaccines but he's a member of that experts institute yeah, so you know this is uh, this is very tricky and sure. complicated. Sure, I think it's a global phenomenon. But you said something, Anike, about distortion, and Nersis. I don't know if it's an Armenian phenomena. I don't know if it's an Armenia phenomena. But we seem to believe in conspiracy theories. Yeah, and um, social media is is just a treasure trove of those things. And people will believe what people will believe. And at the beginning, I said that. Um, you know, we can fact check, but how do you try to present uh, a practical, functional form of the truth? Because I don't want to talk about truth in a philosophical sense or objective facts. Uh, when you try to present it, um, people will still not believe it. They will still believe what their neighbor's grandmother told them about, you know, the vaccine or about why the war broke out. Can, again, as, as a, a political scientist, is there a way to to define, to create, to write, that can win the hearts, because it's not all about intellect, at the, uh, it is absolutely, but it's also about emotions, history, personal baggage, family history, uh, political beliefs. Is it possible, and it, this isn't about having everybody believe in the same thing. I think the beauty of a democracy is that there's a plurality of opinions, um, but it's, opinions also should be based on some facts and on reality. Can we start seeing a, a shift if we do our jobs better? So in a post-Soviet space, can everybody hear me? Let me switch. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Why don't you move it closer? Yeah, to maybe. Your, yeah, maybe. I just left it where he left it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the problems that you're talking about is common throughout the post-Soviet space. So you already Sorry? in the post-Soviet space. So you already begin at a disadvantage if you're a journalist in the post-Soviet space, because the conspiratorial concept, the conspiratorial co thing, uh, uh, culture, is inherent to the way of thinking here. Where does that come from? It comes from distrust of government, right? And distrust of information. So you already begin at a disadvantage. Now, uh, in the post-Soviet space, one of the important things that has contributed to the conspiratorial thinking, uh, and I speak primarily in the South Caucasus, is the magnitude of intellectual laziness that we see in journalists and media. And so the lack of rigor in the products that are being produced, in the content that's being produced, automatically becomes conducive to that kind of thinking. I'm not saying everybody does that, but we have to be honest about it. What is the solution to this? Well, you know, if you look at the, I mean, not to get too academic, but in the literature, there's a relationship between uh, literacy rates and education rates and how conspiracy theories are defunct. So we, you spoke of the United States. In the United States, conspiracy theories work very well with whom? Those who are less educated, more rural, so on and so forth. Uh, the same is the case, for example, in Hungary. We're seeing some of these in Serbia. Uh, so this is not something that's very unique to Armenia. But uh, conspiratorial thinking, one, is inherent to a post-Soviet society. Two, the distrust towards information. And three, the magnitude to which the citizenry is educated to be able to absorb information. As far as the emotional co thing, uh, component that you mentioned, that's very, very important. Because a lot of times, citizens might be confronted with the truth, but they don't want to accept it. And so that is a whole different complication that is very specific to very different cultures. So for example, um, if you're a journalist in Armenia and you're doing reporting, there are some areas that are understandably taboo. You cannot, for example, go and do a piece on the army and whether certain soldiers are drunk on the job or certain commanders are drunk on the job. That is very, very sensitive. And if you do that, that means you're crossing certain lines of being unpatriotic or harmful. But at the same time, if someone does do that, how would society absorb that? So there are certain cultural mores that limit the spread of certain information. These forms of sort of, you know, uh, information flows in some societies become more conducive to conspiratorial thinking, and in other societies don't. Uh, so the way the citizen absorbs information is very, very important. 
The media can't do everything. Uh, therefore, the quality of citizenship, it, not individual or human, but citizenship, the quality of citizenship is very, very important. And in, in modern Armenian society, in a lot of post-Soviet society, most individuals do not have a cogent understanding of citizenship. Yes, you're in Armenia, for example, but how do you understand being a citizen of the Republic of Armenia? These are two different things. And so a lot of these factors kind of you know, intertwine and become conducive to the conspiratorial problems that we see in a lot of the, me the way media's information is absorbed. Uh, Huaydai, when I first moved to Armenia 21 years ago, I used to say even buying tomatoes was an act of politics. So it was a political thing. There was always political discussions taking place where the, the what kind of uh, heritage the, the, the tomato had. It was uh, everything we do in our lives um, is because of or a result of a political or a policy action. I also teach at the American University and I've seen from my students their total distrust or disinterest. They're just tired, exhausted of the bad news, of the uh, the the politicians making promises, not fulfilling them or, or, or not speaking properly. What can we do to engage the younger generation in these processes? Because citizenship, political processes, policy, it affects education, housing, job market, everything. Is there something that we can do to, in the way we write, in the way we, we speak about these political narratives? So the politics in, uh, I'm talking about Lebanon, Syria, it's, like, it's becoming like a, a daily bread and it's like everywhere in this world, it's our daily bread. We, we need to know news, we need to read the news. And now, especially these days with the social media, we jump to the social media, just breaking news, something happening, you know, like people really, Especially the, the new generation, they're tired of the, just, uh, just repeating the same news. And I'm, I'm actually facing this uh, like in Lebanon. In Lebanon, we have the, it's been 30 years we're talking about the corruption. And people are tired of talking about the same, same, repeating the same thing. And we, we, we don't have any solution. And sometimes I tell them I can't find the solution. Me, just I cannot. I don't have the solution. The solution is with the hands of the politics. Like they can find the solution. For instance, like it's been 30 years we're living with no electricity. 30 years with no electricity. We have no power. And these days we have only two hours of power. So people, they're tired of that. Speaking of, uh, of Syria, it's daily destruction, daily striking, daily just uh, starvation. People are suffering, miserable dis displacement. And actually, uh, even our editors, they don't want us to write the same story. We want to find another angle of the story, new angle of the story. So actually, sometimes I try to find something very like, even if, if, if we have the same story every day about corruption, I try to find new angle of this corruption. Sometimes like, I try to find uh, um, just uh, starting from something, uh, something simple, like going to, um, to family's house, uh, try to, 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 to find, for instance, to, to, to see if they have a fridge working, if what, they ha what do they have inside the fridge, if they have food. This starts from this simple, but just to attract the people, to, to keep them interested in the story. Because, because sometimes, you know, I, I found out like, you know, when you, when, you, when you meet people, they tell you, oh, well, the war is over in Syria. Well, the, the life in Lebanon is really nice. No, no, it's not. It's not because we're not, we're not, we're not writing about this. It's, it, it, it ended. So actually, especially, especially as you said, Maria, with the new generation, they always something. They want something new. They want something uh, different, and they want the new stories, new things. Uh, it's, it's very challenging. Very challenging. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> specifically, if, you, if we want to engage uh, with the younger population, we have to f make a specific effort. Because our generation, we are a bit different, they are a bit different, and uh, the way we communicate, maybe it's not good enough for them. So what we have to do is to find the specific set of actions and the specific tone of voice to communicate with the younger auditor audiences. It may be a spe specific, a bit different communication tone on social media. Maybe you have to do TikTok, okay, maybe not do TikTok, but don't do TikTok. <laughs> please don't do TikTok. But yeah, uh, <laughs> we have to find the specific way to engage them. We have to understand them. We have to uh, recruit younger, uh, younger journalists, younger 
social media experts and we have to work with them, we have to trust them in order to show us how to communicate with their generation. Our kids are not on Facebook now. I know, they, yeah, it's so, for old uh, people now, Facebook, yes. yeah. So uh, I know that my kids are on Reddit. So <laughs> I talk to my editors and I, I offer them, you know, we should go to social media and talk their language, generation of young, young lag, uh, of, of, of their language. And it's so funny, you know, that people, for example, in, 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 in national broadcaster in Lithuania, they all concentrated on television. <laughs> it's TV. And, you know, I know that uh, at home we don't switch on the TV. It's, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny that, you know, I do something. Uh, and, and, and nobody it, knows about it. And in your my family. kids, they don't know <laughs> what, what I do. And this is a problem. You know, we can, you know, we can laugh, we can make, you know, uh, fun out of them, uh, out of that. But uh, this is a problem because. Well, we, you have to be on TikTok, like our said. Yes, and we have to be on TikTok, we have to be on Reddit, we have to be everywhere they, they are. You know, it took time to 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 to, to us to to be on Facebook, but yeah. you know, they are not on Facebook anymore. Well, I think uh, there are two actually two chances in this in this current situation because once your students understand that every political narrative is a construction, as you said at the moment at the beginning. Uh, you always have the chance to deconstruct it and to replace it by your own narrative. And so you, the young generation actually has this chance and social media present a very powerful instrument, a tool uh, to, to gain audience and to reach people, reach out to people. And so ev actually they have everything at their disposal to be really powerful and to really have an impact on, on the whole situation. I'm really impressed by this action by these young uh, girls here because it it's resemble, it's reminds me of the situation we had in Germany. I don't know whether you know, everybody knows that Germany, after the Second World War, lost large territories in the east of Europe. 12 million people from, the, from German people were expelled from the east of, uh, of Europe to, back to, to Western Germany. And so actually this question of how do we treat these lost territories? Yeah? What about these territories in the east? was plaguing the German society for decades. Yeah? So really, it's really an interesting example. And I can tell you that at the beginning, it's always like very conservative. All the, the 1950s we spent with claiming these territories back and, uh, and, when, and, and only in the 60s and 70s, the situation began to change and, and we had this new policy of acknowledging these territories are gone and there are new states in the East and so on. So actually, I think it's, it's really a an, an typical example and a very interesting example how to treat this territory and, and how to shape this narrative around it. And it's, of course, it's fundamental and crucial to have a, to have a common narrative on it. So, but I think young people should, should be engaged, as the colleague said, mm -hmm. on the social media and actually be active in constructing this new narrative. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our panelists, Nerses, Anike, Arshak, Indra, and of course, Hoeda. Thank you for listening and thank you for the questions. And we'll have our next panel at four.